So good evening, class. I hope all is well with you. And we are continuing on from our first two lectures to look now at what we're calling um, understanding, conceptualizing the global copyright economy um, still falls under the module of conceptualizing the economics of culture. And today we are looking at the nature, structure, and context of the GCE. Um, GCE is just a, an affectionate um, acronym that we use sometimes to refer to the global cultural economy. Sometimes you may see it as the global creative economy. Um, because of the nature of our course, we are considering this in the context of the global cultural economy. Let me say at this point, though, do not be disheartened if you see a lot of literature on the global creative economy because we have evolved to such in the sense that we now look to understand from an analytical standpoint not just the impacts that culture make on our respective economies across the globe but even broader than that to encompass creativity as a whole so whereas for example culture we would know to be heritage and the performing arts in the context of Trinidad and Tobago when one gives con consideration to the creative economy, it also encompasses for us things like software development, gaming, um, animation, architecture, and so on. So that we use the term sometimes interchangeably, though there is a literature that speaks to that, querying whether or not that is the correct thing to do on the one hand. And of course, there are those who would argue that it's all semantical, creative, cultural economy. It's all about the same. I do believe I have posted one such writing that tries to summarize those debates. Um, for us, though, I am not bogging you down with trying to argue for or against that. We are undergrad, and so we don't need necessarily to have to be able to argue one way or the other but more importantly to be aware of the fact that there is debate around it from that though more more importantly we want to understand what that context that we've been talking about since we started this course looks like this thing that we call an economics of culture and saying that out of economics of culture there's something called a cultural economy what does that look like how is that structured and of course when one considers that, what are some of the contexts, meaning the issues and the trends that we should give consideration to in being able to understand what global creative economy means? All right. So that is where we are going to today. And I begin by offering this quote by Kobayashi, um, which to me, it's a few years out but still for me a very important quote because as much as you know we say sometimes the more things change the more they remain the same we see where even as we have had at least three decades maybe four decades now of an emerging cultural and creative economy it is still becoming an integral part of everything happening in the world as a matter of fact one can easily say that it has taken over in some regards. When one looks across the global economy, the industries prior to COVID that were doing exceptionally well um, were those coming out of the cultural and creative economy. Now with COVID, we are seeing a negative slump, a very awful and dramatic slump in many respects to some aspects of the creative economy across the globe. And I dare say that for those who may have been operating more in the digital environment, the digital context in terms of the, biz, the digital business of the arts and culture, they are the ones who are still able to reap some returns. And we will hear more about that when we step into our video clips towards the end of our lecture. So Kobayashi makes the point not only that the creative economy is becoming an integral part of global trends, um, it's also that the key trends and issues impacting on the GCE 
are also becoming so pervasive that they're becoming part and parcel of the GCE. And so, and if I may just give a, give a heads up about that, technology has been one of the things that have impacted tremendously on the global copyright, sorry, the global cultural economy. And one can, now can see how technology has become a part of the global cultural economy. Can you give an example of technology that impacts on the global cultural economy and at the same time is part of the global cultural economy? In other words, it impacts, but it also helps them make cultural goods and services. Can you give me an example? Anything out of technology or that is a form of technology? When I say technology, we're talking about digital platforms and all. Anything that has to do with technology. Can anyone give a suggestion? It's Wi-Fi. What's that? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi? Yeah. Tell me something that we use in Wi-Fi. That's a bit broad. Something that comes off of the internet. Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Yes. What else? Very Teams. good. <laughs> yes, because it's affecting the education as well. What about one of the more recent dispensations of that, TikTok? Is that not a, a very direct example of that? TikTok impacting on the global creative economy in terms of offering a new platform, a new medium of, of content, um, in terms of content consumption, in terms of um, entertainment, but now because it does that, it now has become a part of the global um, cultural economy, not so? And of course, we know Facebook goes along the same lines. So that we see already from technology, and we will look at two other issues that have done a similar thing, but I wanted to just make sure that you understood what Kobayashi was talking about when he made that comment. Would we call the global cultural economy? When we talk about a global cultural economy, what really are we speaking about? And when you look at this slide here, this tries to give you a breakdown of what that looks like and what that means from a structural standpoint. And one can see that the global cultural economy really has about four broad components. And we call this the onion. And the onion is something that was created by Throsby, as a matter of fact. Now, there are different ways of viewing the global cultural economy. I need you all to understand. But for me, class, this is the one that, clin that clinches it in the sense that it allows for us to see how it builds from the foundation of the arts. You will recall from our first or second lecture when we learned about Stuart Hall, he made the point um, that at the end of the day, even if popular culture becomes the thing that makes the money or popular culture is the thing that is most pervasive, it always starts with the arts. You have to have some kind of talent in some way. Do we agree with that class? must start in some form or fashion with some kind of talent, whether it's um, dance, whether it's theater, music, um, performance, um, masquerade in our case, it must always begin with the arts. And so the argument here, based on how the onion is presented here, is that the arts are the foundation of the creative and cultural industries. And by the creative and cultural industries, what we mean are those businesses that produce content, produce core cultural components, such as museums and galleries and video, anything to do with the performing arts, as well as heritage. And then the creative industries now are wider. Those encompass, as I was saying before, architecture, design, some people would even say fashion more falls in the creative industries realm than the cultural industries. But as we know, there are some forms of fashion that are indigenous to a location or space. And so those kinds of fashion, those elements of fashion would fit squarely.
within the cultural industries category. Beyond that though, it is possible to give consideration to fashion being a part of the creative industries. And then what we argue then is, is that all of these collectively make up the creative economy, which also includes persons who are paid to think work within all sectors of the economy. So for example, I would be considered part of the creative economy. You all will be considered part of the creative economy. Right, but for the most part, because you all are also performers, you will fall somewhere here between the arts and the cultural and creative industries. Does everybody understand the slide and the way it's structured? Can I see by a show of hands? Great. Any questions or comments about that? Have you ever seen that before? Did you ever think of the global cultural economy, creative economy being structured like that? So in your mind, is it that you thought of it in terms of being like some kind of landscape, like a flat thing? I would like to hear your views. When you thought of cultural economy, how did you see it in terms of um, sectors or in terms of activities like dance and theater and what have you? How did you perceive it? Anyone? Nobody? Everybody's here? Gone? So let us look at the structure of the global cultural economy. So the GCE, when one thinks of structure now, so what we looked at were the elements. But if one were to be asked, what is the structure of the global creative economy? These are the elements and you would have to be, you would need to be able to explain each of these elements. So make a note to yourself that you would do a little bit of research where you would Google industries in the global um, cultural economy, creators, educational institutions, so that you can give an explanation and an example. Let us start here by creators. Just like we saw on the previous side, we saw that the arts are the foundation of the global cultural and creative economy. And so it stands to reason that if one has to look at the structure, then creators have to be an important component of that structure because without creators there will be no cultural goods and services agree there will be nothing um that would be sold or nothing to be offered for sale so to speak there will be no demand and supply without the work of creatives agree we will remember that thrusby made the argument to us about demand and supply saying that as long as there is a transaction between artists or slash performer and audience, it means that demand and supply is occurring. So therefore, creators are important. You know, we forgot one inside of here. And the same way we have creators, we also have to have consumer inside of there. So I will include that before I send you the, the actual PowerPoint. So creators, are an important starting point in terms of understanding the structure of the GCE. And by creators, we mean not just those who create in terms of design, but also artists, performers, thinkers on creative stuff, persons like myself who offer support services to creators. All right, so make a note of that. The GCE also encompasses industry. And by industry, we are referring to any kind of commercial transactions or engagement, any kind of business, that enterprise that is going on regarding the arts and culture. And so that is where now one would have the creative workers, because a creative does not necessarily have to be a creative. We, hope we can appreciate that. A creative is someone who produces culture but may not necessarily be a creative worker okay but workers are creatives 
Does everybody appreciate that point? Do we understand that? Right? So in, yeah. the, so in the industry context, we have the creative worker. We have the creative and cultural enterprises. And all of these come together and make up sectors that make up industries. So we talk about the music industry. We talk about the recording industry. We talk about the performing arts industry. We talk about the carnival industry. We talk about um, animation, film industry, and so on and so forth. So all of those, therefore, fall inside this box here when we talk about industry. Names of companies would fall inside of here. So if you own a business that falls within the creative industries, that is where it would fall here when we talk about industry as one of the structural elements of the global creative and cultural economy. Also there to be considered the state government. Why is government here as part of the global cultural economy class? Tell me. When we say the state, we mean government. Why is government here as part of this structure? Anyone? They are the ones who have to um, provide funding for institutes. Such as? And how, you, well, not such as, um, in what, through what mechanism or through what arm of government do they do that? That's the better way to ask it. Um, how does government provide funding? Through what? Do you go to a Dr. Rowley and say, sir, can I have some money for for my, my project in the arts? There's two grants. And yes, and where do those come from? What's the structural component that, that affords that, that allows for you to access grants? Where does it come from? The Ministry of the Government. The Ministry of? Not hearing Creative me. Arts. Right, so the ministries that are concerned with culture, community development you have you all have to be able to explain these things clearly yeah? you can't be vague right so the the ministries that are concerned with culture the creative arts community development perhaps even education are the ones that are responsible for disbursing and facilitating support to the rest of the creative economy or the cultural economy so you have at the state level, you have at the local level, which would be government. At the regional level, you will have CARICOM. And at the global level, you have organizations such as UNESCO trying to do that kind of work. Everybody understands that? Can you repeat it, please? I'm saying to you that the state through its ministries such as culture, community development, creative arts, are the ones that are responsible for facilitating support, whether it's money or otherwise, to the other aspects of the creative economy. At the local level, you would have the state, which will be the government, and that happens through its ministries that we just mentioned. At the regional level, that would be CARICOM, as an example. And you see here next to the state, we have regional bodies. So that's where CARICOM would come. Caribbean Export would come there. Um, Caribbean Development Bank. All of these have various interests in offering funding and technical support towards the advancement of the Caribbean creative economy. And then at the global level, in terms of governments, governance and facilitation, you have entities such as the Inter-American Development Bank. You have, for example, UNESCO. You have, for example, Organization of American States. Um, you have WIPO. So at the global level now, there are also bodies. That's what we call them, bodies or entities that are concerned with the development and the advancement of the global creative economy. We have two more here. We have IPR agencies. So these will be where your copyright agencies and collective agencies are, are placed. And that is because, of course, it is through copyright and intellectual property that we are able to derive more sustainable returns 
from our cultural goods and services. And then last but not least are our educational institutions, which is where, of course, the training um, occurs. Class, kindly note, educational institution does not necessarily only have to be formal, such as in the case of DCFA at UWI, but they can be informal, although well-structured, could be coming out of the community, for example, through a workshop engagement, can be NGO, penny um, interventions. Um, for example, for those of you who've done festival project before, like Liana, you know, educational context here would also be that, where there's passing on from one creative to other budding creatives. Okay? Everybody understands that? So let's take a look at context. So when we speak about context now, so we've talked about what it is already. We've spoken about the nature of it. And now we want to take a look at context before we go into looking at our video presentations for this evening that will round up today's class. And there are really three things that you want to understand when we are looking at context as it relates to the global cultural or creative economy. The first is historical context to understand where it all began. The second is trends, trends in terms of what's bubbling and what's going on, um, what continues to make the global creative economy um, at the forefront. So for example, we talked about TikTok as an example um, on Facebook being trendy, but also key issues in terms of there may be trend generating, but there may also be some issues there, challenges that continue to um, shape the face of the global creative economy. So key issues can also encompass negative um, challenges. Could you hold one moment for me, class? I see the dean is calling. Yes, class, we're going again. So as I was saying about context, historical context is where it all began when we talk about. So the point is, if we are to understand trends and key issues, it's important that we understand where this global cultural economy would have come from. How did it emerge? What caused this emergence? All right. And in understanding historical context, it helps us to understand why there will be certain issues, and of course, why it is that certain trends may evolve while some may fall off and why some may continue to be burning trends or hot trends where the development and continued evolution of the global cultural economy is concerned. So let's look first at the historical context and then we will deal with key issues and trends. So for historical context, I want you to take a note. You want to go into Hezmanda. Um, I believe I would have placed the link there. If I have not, um, if you can get your hands on it, I believe, I think the UWI has it online through the library. If not, what you can do is you can Google historical context of the global cultural economy or the, em or the emergence of the global cultural economy, and that would be of use. That, that would lead you directly to, to a further explanation of what you see here listed here on this slide. So 
One saw the cultural economy across the world emerging around the 1980s, 1990s. And what triggered that emergence was the fact that a lot of corporations were losing their competitive advantage. They're, in other words, they were not as competitive as they used to be in whatever were the, the general areas that they were operating in. There is a very notable example. I don't know you all have ever heard of the brand White Westinghouse, but White Westinghouse years ago was a major appliance manufacturer. They were known especially for washing machines and dryers and deep freeze and fridge and these kinds of things for those of you who may be too young to know. And at a point in time, as with many businesses, sometimes in these sectors, their um, profits began to decline. And so White Westinghouse invested in the cultural economy by buying into one of the recording labels. I believe they're the ones who had also purchased Hallmark. And so what we saw happening in the 1980s and 1990s were a lot of corporations coming out of more traditional sectors and industries look in to expand their profit and their interest so that they could they could stay afloat and make more money by getting into the cultural um, industries. From there, we started to see then a number of mergers and acquisitions occurring in the 1990s. Um, some of you may be too young to know of these terms, but it was a time when you used to talk about the big six, which were the the six that dominated the music industry across the globe. So you can Google that as well so that you can have an understanding of those labels. And in that time, the record labels were the dominant um, group, dominant aspect of the global cultural economy. Um, when people were signed to a label, um, that was like being married almost. And most times, artists did not own in their entirety, their music, their content. So I don't know if you've recently heard Kanye West um, screaming about this. Are you all familiar with that, that story? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, so Kanye West is right now, he is upset because he can't get out of his contract with his label, similar thing. You might have known as, of Prince as well, being in a similar situation. There was a time when we used to refer to Prince as the or artist formerly known as Prince because even his name, the label owned. So in the days when the cultural industries were dominated by the big six, it was these kinds of structures. As we can see from the two examples that I just gave there, some of that still ob obtains um, within the, the industry, but it is not as widespread as before. Can you think of one of the things that have that has decreased the, the so-called big sixes control over the music industry? What do you think has contributed to artists having more control over their creative works? Name one thing. Can anyone? Miss, I don't know if it's right there, yeah, but some of them hiring like lawyers to look into the contract before they sign into it. I don't know if I'm correct. That is that is not incorrect, but that's not exactly what I'm looking for. There's mm -hmm. one thing that has made it easier for artists to have greater control. So let's let's take for example, do any of you all follow artists online like say Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that? Yeah. Whether global or local artists. Yes? Yes. Yeah. And you may be too young to know, but there was a time when you did not have that kind of access. And you do see them exposing their lives and engaging with their fans and what have you. Not so. Sometimes they may sing. Sometimes they release music that way and so on and so forth. True or false? True. So digitization has allowed for that. So there are artists such as Rihanna, she owns her whole catalog, she bought that, right? Digitization has allowed for artists to circumvent the label and that is what 
helped to contribute to the big six collapsing in a sense. I'm not saying that record labels are still not powerful, but back in the day when there was a big six, that was it. And if you notice from the second point underneath, it was the same with Hollywood film industry. It was dominated by eight companies. And I, I have here no decrease to big five. It might even be about three now. But we also know that there's some independents that have emerged and have taken over as well. So you can also Google to identify what companies, what are the five top major companies in the Hollywood film industry. So for example, back when this was the case in the 1990s, um, someone like Tyler Perry would not have been um, a major film company production house at all, you see? And so we have seen an evolution and a shift as well um, for other socio-cultural dynamics um, that have made the ownership and control um, within the global cultural economy to be more widespread. That is not to say that there are still not issues of dominance and dynamics beyond the creatives, but it is certainly different as it was when it first started. With that historical context, um, after the 90s, we also saw these factors coming into play, where we saw a shift from cultural goods to cultural services, virtual goods. So somewhere coming into the 90s, mid 90s, this is where digitization started to emerge. And so we were very much more now um, inclined and, and curious about purchasing intangible stuff there. Um, so we, we buy a lot of things online. Um, we purchase to see things online now. Um, some people are into gaming such that they, they pay a dollar US to play a game and to continue playing a game and so on. So that we've moved from production of physical things to virtual production of virtual consumption. Now, talent has become um, competitive, and I know some people would argue against that, but it has because creative talent isn't just about performance as we know class, right? But creative talent can also encompass the way in which you present yourself, how you build your image. If you don't have a strong image or a strong brand that is very much tied to you, that makes the audience believe you, we know that you won't, are not necessarily as popular as, as others who are doing so. So creative talent became increasingly a competitive advantage um, so that brands then wanted to tie themselves now to artists and performers. We saw the rise of the cultural entrepreneur. So this is where Oprah came into being. This is where Bill Gates came into being. Ted Turner of CNN, and we could call Warren Buffet, and we could call many names. All of this then started to happen post 1990s. And of course, new marketing methods started to come into play. A lot of what we see now in terms of how artists are tied to products and services, all of that started just as we were coming into the mid 1990s. And last but not least, demographic shifts. And this is something that we in the Caribbean are very aware of because we would have seen that happen in terms of people leaving the Caribbean and going abroad, forming carnivals, coming back here to consume the carnivals here. Um, and so when we talk about demographic shifts, that's just one of the examples. But demographic shifts also in terms of people's taste shifting. So for example, people wanting to travel more. Now that we're in the COVID scenario, we are obviously seeing a new shift where people now are more inclined to consume what is local. Because of course, like in our case, we can't even travel. And so traveling now is literally what Trinidadians would say is traveling. Moving from here to Mayaro, for example, or if you could get to Tobago or going down to visit Liana Maruga, you know, that, that is like a big exciting thing now to do because you cannot get on a plane. So when we talk about demographic shifts, we also talk about people's patterns, habits, shifting, and, and their consumption level of certain cultural goods and services heightens more than, than other things. 
one of the things that we've seen, for example, people are consuming Netflix more than cable. How many people here watch Netflix more than they watch Flow? As in cable. By a show of hands. Nicole, Samantha saying yes because she turned on her screen. Where is Arena? Arena like she in here. Arena here or she in here? Right? So I too. I, I don't even have flow again. So if you notice, class, there has been an interesting kind of shift away from, because flow is, a, in a sense, a kind of a physical product. Not so, class. You, you, the cable man has to come and wear you up and bring this big, jokey-looking box and whatnot. Now, we are operating in a, in a world where your, your Wi-Fi box is probably no bigger than this, and your your way of accessing cable is on a stick looking like that, not so a fire stick. And that's about the size of it. And you are seeing everything there that you would have seen had were you purchasing um, flow. So that these are some of the examples of how we have seen demographic shifts. Demographic shifts we, we um, refer to changes in lifestyle, refers to shifts in taste, um, shifts in, in preference, and so on. Any questions about that class? Is that clear? So far, so good? Nothing taxing. Okay, great. So yeah. let's go again. Now, when it comes to trends, so we've looked at context in terms of the historical context. We have two more things to look at. We want to look at trends and we want to look at issues. But when it comes to trends now, class, trends are very dynamic. And so one of the things that we do as analysts when we want to look at the global cultural economy is to use an analytical tool to help us to pick up those trends. And so we call it the pestle. You may know it as select if you've ever done this kind of work before, but we also mean the political factors economic factors, social factors, legal, environmental, and technological factors that impact on the global cultural economy. So what we argue is, is that there are all these things going on outside of there that we can categorize under these headings here. And, what, and anytime it impacts on the global cultural economy, we consider that to be a trend. So for example, one of the technological factors that has emerged is the rise of social media platforms that are more interactive, right? For example, Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, and so on and so forth. So that now is considered a trend. Is it not, class? Are we not all logged on to these things in some form or fashion? Yes, exactly. A social factor, particularly in the post-COVID environment, a preference for smaller gatherings, more intimate, more um, family oriented. Um, people um, entertainment now is more tuned to their online engagement or their television, as opposed to going to the movies or going to a party in certain places. So that falls on the social. So that of course would be an example of a social trend. Another example would be our shift in consumption. We, we are buying more food, not so class. What else is there to buy? Aren't people in general purchasing more food, whether it's in the grocery or going and buying takeout curbside, as opposed to, and I suppose in some regards, people, more alcohol is being purchased. As a matter of fact, one can even identify what kinds of alcohol locally um, being purchased more than others because people now have to watch the disposable income. So the high-end beverages are not going to be purchased as, yes, I should say alcohol for sure. Yes, I had an interesting experience where going up to, we were going mayor or some friends and I, and we stopped off at that grocery. I don't know if you all know the Eastwell Valencia. There's a grocery in the corner. They always have some nice deals and stuff right in the bend there. And we wanted to get brown rum. Would you imagine not a bottle of brown rum on that shelf? They had scotch, they had brandy. They, well, they hardly had brandy, but they had scotch. 
and no brown run, no Angostura 1990, no black and black, what do you call that, black label? What do you think they had as rum class? Could you hazard a guess? The three shells line off with what class? Punching. Punching and? Black and white. White oak. White oak. All you see in is silver, silver, silver. It was amazing. Well, because this is my line of work, of course, you know, I had to question the cashier. I, I asked her, I said, so is it that you all have run out of She said, no, we don't order it again. Nobody, nobody does drink that. Can you imagine our class in a matter of two years, White Oak and Forest Park have literally pushed out brown rum as the average Joe's drink. Yes, people still drink it, but not in that common not as a common denominator in in the space of going up further east so these are some of the examples when we talk about social impact right and as we know there's going to be if we remember our lecture when we talked about cultural value and high culture and low culture there may come a time where it may become gentrified if the price of that ever keeps going goes going up you know it will then move from being an everybody's drink to only certain people drinking it because it has already it is reasonably priced and a lot of people from all walks of life drink these particular beverages right so those are some of the examples when we talk about um identifying the trends and just as i was discussing it there with you class that is the way in which we would want for you to discuss it to identify what the factor is how it's a trend and then to, to give an example that we are clear that you understand what you're talking about, why you say it's a social trend or why it's a economic trend or why it's technological and so on and so forth. Does everybody understand how the PESO works? Yes. Okay, great. So to give a further example, this one is, so sometimes we talk about pestle, sometimes we talk about pest or slep. So this, this one is just a pest. This just gives you four as an example. So all of these are examples of factors that tend to impact on the global cultural economy. So anytime you have that to do, this is how it is expected to be laid out. But you don't just write them. You have to be able to explain. So, for example, why is this? Why is the the environment, or why is current legislation in the home market impacting on the global cultural economy or the cultural economy where you are living? So the point is, this is a very broad list. So each one may not necessarily be relevant to the cultural economy that you are analyzing. So. And these are not necessarily the only ones. The list is not exhaustive, okay? But this is here as a guide to show you the kinds of factors that fall under each category. Within the political, I'm seeing some that may very well fall under environmental, like this first one. But I believe they collapsed it to make it simple that you could get an idea of how the analytical framework works. So this is within the lecture. And so you can refer to it at, in your time to be able to test it out. I encourage you to, because this is one of the areas that will be in there for presentation discussion. All right. So let us look at critical issues now. So again, to recap, to be sure that we are still on the same page, when talking about context, we spoke about historical context to get a sense of how we arrived here with a global cultural economy. We talked about key trends and we looked particularly at the pestle or the, the pest analysis to see how we can use that as an analytical tool to help us identify trends. And now thirdly, we want to be able to identify what are the critical issues that relate to the global cultural economy. And there are really three, as you see, I have here. I would have started talking about the first one, technology, when we started class. But there's also commodification, which we would have discussed in one of our earlier lectures. 
And then last but not least, IPRs, which refers to intellectual property rights. In this class, we are particularly concerned with copyright within intellectual property rights, all right? Because copyright is the branch of intellectual property that is concerned with cultural and creative works, the creation of culture and creative works. And so even though we have IPRs here, we are particularly concerned with copyrights here where this discussion is concerned. Let us look at each one briefly before we get into our videos. So the issue of commodification really comes from, you would recall when we talked about Adorno in the first class and him having a problem with the commodification of the arts and culture. Remember, Adorno was the one who said that the arts and culture should always just be for pure fun, pure enjoyment, simply to be enjoyed for the aesthetic purpose and not to be made into business or to be made into industry. And he was very quick also to point out that commodification of the arts was only occurring because capitalists wanted to find ways to make more money and to continue to be profitable, prominent, powerful, and in control. Certainly, from my example of the recording industry, when we were talking about artists not having control over their creative works, I think would be a suitable example um, to refer to in, relevant, in reference to Adorno's thesis. And so Adorno's three points are brought back here in terms of talking about commodification and the characteristics of commodification. If I remember correctly, we had seen how there were aspects of Adorno's argument that were definitely um, relevant today as they were when he would have made his contention. And so commodification continues to be an issue um, impacting on the global cultural economy. We see it as an issue because on the one hand, it's a good thing, but on the other hand, it has its challenges. So one of the things that you need to do for a homework class is to do a search and identify what are the positive characteristics of commodification in relation to the global cultural economy and what are some of the negative characteristics of commodification in relation to the global cultural economy? Are we clear on that class? Everybody understands what you have to do there? Right, great. Let us look now at technology. We spoke about technology before and so what I've tried to do in this, this slide is to give you a breakdown of some of the ideas that relate to technology in terms of how they impact on the global cultural economy. Digitization is the leading aspect of technology that impacts on the global cultural economy. I would want for you class to do a Google and get a proper definition of digitization. I don't want you to get a Webster's Dictionary definition, please. I would refer you to, you could look into the Hesmonda, um, the Cultural Industries. By the way, that book can be purchased via Kindle um, for as little as 12 US dollars or something like that. So you can certainly take a look at that and you can download the Kindle um, platform now for free. So if you go onto Amazon, you can take a look and you will see it there. What I also want you to appreciate though, that digitization has these components. And so when you go into the Hesmonda, you will see where he gives a brief discussion of each one of these in terms of showing how it is that these impact on, how this is an issue um, as it pertains to the global cultural economy. And then last but not least, the issue of intellectual property rights. So because of technology and commodification, 
intellectual property rights is now a big deal. And copyright is very much the underbelly of wealth where cultural goods and services are concerned. It is technology that has shifted the global creative economy to a world of rights and clicks, as I call it, moving from bricks to clicks. So it is technology that would have made the big six and the big side five lose their power for the most part. When you think about it, class, an artist does not necessarily need a label now to, to, to promote a song or to perform a song now. Um, the artist can go online and, and do their thing. And as a matter of fact, artists now are able to accrue more directly their revenue from their content because of the way how the internet and digitalization has set up the internet now. It comes more directly to them. They no longer need the companies as the middleman to do a lot of that heavy lifting as has happened before. It is also too that because we are now more in a virtual context, a virtual world, that knowledge now is be has become now a main source of income and revenue generation. And knowledge, if it is to be sustainable in terms of revenue generation, it must be underpinned or must be captured or what to say, protected by intellectual property rights, in particular copyright. And so I would want for you to go into the Hesmonda. You can also Google, if you don't get the Hesmonda in a timely fashion, copyright and cultural industries or copyright and the global creative economy. And you are sure to get some good readings. You can also go into the course outline. All of the readings I have there, you can access what is not accessible by the copy and pasting of the link, I will place onto the Teams platform. If there's one that's not there, all you have to do is send me a message and I will happily put it onto the Teams platform because chances are if there's no link there, it means I already have it in my collection and it's just a matter of posting it for you. That is with respect to all the others except for the Hesmonda. I don't believe I had a chance to take my copy out of the um, out of my office. Um, and I don't have a recent edition as well. I am able to access the Kindle. I did ask for a free copy, but it does not seem to allow me to share. So as a matter of fact, class, if you go onto the Amazon, you can and you say you want the Kindle version, it allows you to click on a free copy that you can use. I think it's it's part of it, it's a sample, but it actually allows for you to see one of the early chapters that you need. Um, the one to do with technology and IPRs, however, is further down in the book, and I'm not sure if you're allowed to get at that. But he does discuss in the first two chapters or so of the book, technology as well, and how it relates to the growth of the cultural industries and the global cultural economy. Okay. Any questions about that class? Was that comprehensive enough? Right, you have to go into files, Asher, and you will see the course outline there, it's not a link. So when you go into the section of files um, for the course in the Teams group, you will see the course outline having been posted there. You click on it and you download it. And when you go into the course outline under the section of readings, I don't know if all, I don't believe they're pasted there that you can click on them directly. You will have to cut and paste the link into your browser. Well, not cut, copy and paste the link into your browser. Right, great. Copy and paste the link into your browser and that would allow you direct access to whatever I've posted there. Do note that I have categorized the readings according to the module, not to overwhelm you. So it's not a lot of readings. I've tried to make it as concise as possible that it's quite manageable for you. Um, there are three modules, and so I believe I have three sets of readings and just some for the closing lecture, all quite manageable, quite easy for you to digest. 
we will certainly find out within a week's time or so when we begin our presentations and you will also receive your dates for your essays and, and what have you. As I said later on tonight, I will also post your assignments folder there in that same file section of the Teams platform. Are there any questions or comments at this time? OK, so we don't have a formal tutorial today, but I do want to. I'm not closing off the classes yet. I do want to share with you snippets from three important videos to me that help to reflect some of what we were discussing um, in today's class in terms of the global cultural economy. So and I have them posted into the lecture, so it will be easy for you to look at it at your leisure as well and to help enhance your understanding of this topic. Do let me know if you are still able to see it. Are you seeing it? Uh, I know that you all are now. Is it still part of the shared screen? Are you seeing it? No, I'm just seeing PowerPoint. OK, so let me take off the PowerPoint and I will and as a matter of fact, give me a minute because I believe I want to go to the one from the Caribbean first. You can read, you can look at this other one at your leisure. Let me see which one this is. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, so this one I would like for you to take a look at first before we get to the snippet from the from the Caribbean. We get the Caribbean perspective. Is everybody seeing the screen? COVID-19 impact on the creative industry? Yeah, man. Great. I'm not hearing anything. Miss, I'm not hearing anything on the video pause. Right. Are you no. hearing again yes. now? Ages Network. Uh, Yeah, me from here. Is Rana Barua from Harpas, Rohit Ori from FCB, and Amir Zaleen from Low. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. Truly a pleasure having you on Brand Equity, and lovely seeing all of you in your respective homes. But happy to at least see your faces. Let me start with uh, let me start with you, Agnello, uh, and let me get this discussion rolling. Uh, it's been uh, some time now since. We've all been under lockdown. We've all, have, we've all had some time to digest uh, our new reality. Uh, we've also had time to reassess uh, what this is uh, currently doing to our respective businesses. And today I want to focus specifically on the creative industry. Uh, you know, shootings have been stalled. We don't have really uh, a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of where production can actually uh, restart. We're looking at, uh, you know, stop gap means of how all of you and the entire creative fraternity is trying to engage uh, with the uh, client.
clients and put out, you know, adverts that is best possible during these challenging times. Uh, what is the current ground reality uh, that you're facing and the industry is facing, Aggie? So one of the reasons why it's difficult to see a light at the end of the tunnel is because no one really knows where the tunnel is. So the light is visible, but uh, the constraints that come with a situation like this are not yet finalized. And there are two parts to the constraints. One is obviously the so-called virus itself. And the second are the regulatory conditions put in place by governments and organizations in order to uh, function smoothly. Right now, uh, everything we do is uh, almost boot camp emergency like for the current situation, but it can't be said to be a long-term kind of situation or solution until we know the long-term restrictions in place. Currently, even the restrictions are definitely. Uh, let me take it to you, Rana. Uh, you know, we all know that we're all currently stuck at home and this is our new normal for some time to come. Yes, there is uh, why people may be awaiting the, whether the lockdown will be lifted on the 3rd of May or not. I think it's very clear that uh, for, you know, la large parts of the country, the lockdown will continue. Having said that, what is the current state of the business? What is the current ground reality? What is the kind of uh, revenue impact all of you are having? And uh, how, what is the spiral effect of that? So, Sonali, you're right. Uh, you know, I, I think it's very clear that all businesses are getting impacted. Uh, you know, if I just look at it from a group perspective, uh, which is covering certain aspects, which is creative or advertising media and many other aspects, there are certain aspects which are getting severely impacted. So if you look at experiential marketing and ground events and activations, I think that's the most impacted in terms of everything is naturally gone under the radar. Nothing is going to happen for maybe the next two quarters. Uh, God alone knows maybe the next few quarters. Uh, but if you look at an overall perspective from a mix of both creative and media, of course there are certain uh, creative clients or work that keeps happening and um, there will be a downward spiral going down and we are not sure at least from our perspective what is the exact percentage but you can take it anything between 10 to 20 percent kind of an impact that is bound to happen in the overall creative aspect from our angle but if i look from a media perspective also if i combine those kind of numbers the numbers keep varying on a month-on-month -month basis depending on how much are we extending the lockdown sure uh, let me take that uh, to you amir and let's uh, take that uh, point forward and take off from where Rana left. Uh, what is your understanding of normalcy really? Uh, I think one is very clear that, you know, advertising and advertising production will not be looked at, ad agencies and ad production will not be looked at by the government at least as essential services. Uh, given that, we don't think that production will start anytime soon in terms of shooting. Uh, in such a scenario, uh, you know, all one can do is continue to do this kind of, uh, you know, shoots which is from your mobile phone and, you know, put, uh, you know, visuals together on an edit machine and, and release them. And that seems to be, you know, what we're all currently happy with because of, of the current situation. Is this, uh, you know, going to be a continued effort? What are clients saying? Are they happy with the output? Are they, uh, you know, are they telling you that uh, they would actually like to, uh, you know, withdraw and uh, not do anything for some time until they they understand themselves what's happening, what's happening on ground, what are clients, uh, other agencies, yourselves, and of course internationally, what is the conversation happening from your respective group companies? Let me start by uh, answering you on what is uh, happening back at the virtual office. That we are running right now. Uh, the first thing is that we have different kind of clients, and some clients are reacting to the crisis, and some clients are planning for the world beyond the crisis. We are working with both kind of clients. Uh, the, the people who are uh, reacting to the crisis are, uh, you know, more uh, in terms of banks and financial companies. They are also uh, health brands and uh, FMCG brands and things like that. But there are many other brands that uh, businesses are right now not working, not on. And for them, uh, life continues as usual in terms of strategizing and planning for the beyond. So both kinds of things are happening from Now, in terms of the work we are creating, uh, 
uh, Rohit. Uh, you heard three of them. Uh, let me ask you the the brass tacks question, which is really what kind of contraction uh, of the entire advertising industry are we going to see uh, in 2020, 2021? And uh, you know, let's I don't know what's going to happen post that, so let's not go there. But at least for this year. What is the sizable contraction we can see as an industry at large? The contraction of the business that we have is is directly proportional to how we respond to the crisis. If we see it as a crisis and we shrink ourselves, you know, one of the things that I've been hearing uh, across networks is really about furloughs and, and uh, job cuts and, uh, you know, uh, salary cuts, etc. But the thing is, at this point in time, if an agency has to come out of this crisis and when we, uh, you know, uh, we start working through the time now and the time to come, really what, what will get us is through is our engine, right? And our engine is our people. So we need to keep our teams motivated, energized, not, uh, you know, crushed and demotivated, uh, you know, shrink our core capabilities, bring our uh, resources down to a point of, uh, you know, uh, where it's, it becomes hard to work. Uh, Aggie, let me bring it to you. You heard four of them and you heard, you heard Rohit last who says that, you know, creativity must be, we as an industry must try and, you know, get those lights in that dark tunnel and uh, not be fast to act on, you know, whether it be furloughs or, or, you know, job cuts and all of that and, you know, try and keep our head above water until these dark times pass. But that's Okay, class, has everyone been paying attention to the discussion so far? Was everyone hearing the discussion so far? Okay. Yes, Miss. But can I get you off where the man say um, they don't know when this thing will an end? <laughs> <laughs> and so that, he, is as, it gonna be? yeah as much as you say it like that that for me and you wouldn't believe that was one of the first questions i was going to pose to you all if based on that discussion there is there something that you picked up as a characteristic of the, the creative economy? Just one minute, class. I'm going to call again. Please discuss that amongst yourselves. I'll be back shortly.
Yes, class, sorry about that. So ironic, and that was just about your assessment. That's why I was delaying it, you know, because it has to be approved first by the board. Okay, so then now I can definitely send it out tonight. Right, so we were discussing about the, um, the video. Did you pick up anything in line of what Liana was just saying there about when he said, we don't know when this thing going to end? that we could say is characteristic of the global cultural economy. Is there anything you picked up there? Anyone? We all still here, only Leanna and I here. I will help a little to, to have the discussion. But uncertainty, so it's almost like a double whammy because the global creative economy was always uncertain. It always operated in a context of uncertainty. You know what is a hit today? Be a hit tomorrow. And here it is now, we've been impacted by COVID. And it is very clear that even in the context of the advertising um, sector, and, we, and I chose this one deliberately because advertising is part of the creative economy. But as you all would know, as creatives yourself, the advertising agency or the advertising sector utilizes a lot of the cultural economy as well in terms of script writing, actors, performance, and so on and so forth with regard to developing ads and marketing um, campaigns and so on. So that for that sector, it is very clear that uncertainty has plagued the sector in a sense of making it difficult to decide how to go forward. That's one. Did you hear anything what we learned about the structure of the GCE? Were any of the players identified that we would have discussed in the early part of our lecture? Could you name at least one? If I get you off when you say that, so I really didn't pick up. <laughs> Anyone else? So you have to go back and look at the video. Class, you all need to pay attention. Eh? When you have your assignments to do, you will struggle. Eh? Right? We can't come here and, you know, we put on our mic and screen and then we go off and do other things. We really have to be focused and try to capture what's going on in class because it will be challenging. This is material that you have to engage, you know, um, so that you would have heard him mention the state. They talked about government and the fact that it's not clear that government is going to be giving much to that particular sector. Is this something that we um, are familiar with in our own neck of the woods? What has been the context where COVID is concerned with our own cultural economy? Is it yes. not similar? Yes, it's because right now the state of the culture grant also um, people in the culture, right, like Calypsonians, artists, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. for people who had shows and all of that. But they only gave the grant out once, and not everybody got the grants. I saw someone posting today that is on until December, so that, does that mean that you can you can apply for it Yeah, still? you can apply, but it's taking kind of long, in shall we? Wow. Because I wasn't going to apply due to, I know, the length of time. But they told me to apply for it because my haunted house got cancelled. Yes. And that will have bring in employment for right. some of the youths and them. Yes. But they take it long, 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 long. For all the grants, they will take long because um, they have to go through and do an entire background check. Because a lot of people have apparently been committing fraud um, and have been applying fraudulently. So it will take long, and then too, because it, um, we are in the cultural industry, they need to be able to prove they need us. They will need us so so to an extent prove that we would have been making such and such money over this period of time. That is so it's, unfortunate. Because it's easy to say you're a performer, but if you're only performing once a year then that's not fair to the creatives mm -hmm. who are working year round. Mm -hmm. Do you not think that the artist registry would have helped with that class? 
How well is that working to your knowledge? Miss, well, that, uh, people uh, you, you registered. If you go on watch your artist registry, not much people are registered. Unfortunate. And, and, you know, let's ask a controversial question. How far does a government or should a government have to go in terms of giving support to its sector? So let's take not so much the grant, but let's take the same artist registry. What would it need for the government to do to get more people to sign? Um, because for me, I if I were them, I would have connected the dot to that. I would have said, well, if you want to get this grant, you need to sign up in your artist registry. And and then populate the database in that way. Do you think that that would have helped? Or do Miss, you think that they would have had fraud there as well? Um, being part of the artist registry, I think some of them don't have, like it has certain things you have to send in to them. I think some of them don't have it because I am there with my company plus an individual because, I, you know, I do mass and all them things. So they made me sign up for the two. But I have like with the group, you have to have a bank account. Some people that's just open up a group just so. You have to show your proof of your bank account and your registration. Because my... So, so, so then, so class again i i have I a copy to, of the um form. and I, I i want you to go back and go through the lecture that we did today because eh? i know you all were halfway and halfway out as i was talking again do you not see one of the issues that i raised here coming up because then that's not an artist registry that is a creative worker registry because an artist does not necessarily have to have a, a bank account. Remember the point I made about the distinction between a creative worker and a creative. But it have two sets, you know, it have the creative and it have for the groups. If you're with a group, you have to have the bank account. I have so um not creative. Yeah. And it have the whole list of things that you could take off what you're under. Because like me, I could fall under carnival, could fall under culture could fall under storytelling. Okay. I want you to go back and complete, though, this particular um, video. Um, the reason I chose it was because it's from India in the sense of India, um, its sectors have evolved similar to ours in the Caribbean, but, of course, India, because of its, its Bollywood, is one of the leading um, economies where the cultural economy is concerned. Um, it's also that it was interesting to hear that a large nation such as India, the way in which the government was treated with the sector in light of COVID. And of course, it would have given us an opportunity to look at some of the realities in the COVID context with regard to the global creative economy. I just want to do a quick run through now of the last one before we break up just for about 10 minutes to look now at some of the context closer to home now in light of the pandemic and of course now in terms of understanding how our, our, how our regional creative economy um, works in some regards. This one is giving a spotlight on the um, music industry in the sub-region of the OECS. So please stand by while I switch out of that particular video and carry you now to that discussion coming out of the OECS.
Class, I'm going to speed up away from here to get to two of the artists' comments, if you don't mind. Hopefully it will. Are you hearing this clearly, class? Miss we hear but we ain't seeing any of the screen blank. The audio is breaking up for me. The audio is breaking up for me. Let me see if I can reshare the screen. And if not, I will leave the link embedded into the um and allow for you all to look at it. I think I'll pause here because it may not come back up. You're hearing, but you're not seeing. Is it? Are you seeing it now? I'm seeing, but yes, um, the audio is breaking up a lot. Right. Okay. So we're going to, we will pause it, and I am encouraging you to take a look at it. Um, when you receive the lecture with the links inside of it. Right. Okay.